If you want to turn in your hymnal right now, the Brown Hymnal 364, kind of hold that in readiness. I'd like to sing this song at the end of my message. If you want to turn in the scriptures, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. That's what we're going to be looking tonight, particularly, particularly verse 14. I'll give you the text, and then I'm going to say some introductory things to lay kind of a foundation for the reception of this message, and then we'll get right into it. The apostle, speaking to believers at uh, Thessalonica, says these things for the Spirit. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brother and beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've titled this message, Called to Apprehend Christ's Glory. There are kind of two pillars, strains of thought that I'm going to be looking at tonight that are, that are like pillars of edification. One is the fact that God does have a purpose. That from the beginning he has in fact chosen us and he has called us by divine intention for the reception of Christ's glory. And then that being that, the other pillar. It is for this very purpose that God has called us, sanctified us, justified us, redeemed us, brought us into this process. What's the great end of it? That we might apprehend, obtain, lay hold on. It's an experience. Christ's glory. That's pretty big, isn't it? Amen. Now, the greatness of salvation can be confirmed by a great many things. One is its cost. Salvation is very costly. It is free to us, but it is costly to God. You see, the Bible says that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And then the Spirit reasons, how shall he not with him also freely given us all things? God has given us his best. You want to know how serious God is about salvation? He did not spare his son when the time came for someone to pay the price. And if he's already given us his best, what do you suppose that he would withhold from you? If he gave you his son, would he withhold grace in the time of need? Indeed not. See, it's been a costly work. And it's got a pretty glorious sin. It does. The greatness of salvation can be measured by who was demanded to do the work. See, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians... He said, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Amen. Are those necessary in salvation? Yes. Indeed. See, we talk about the necessary part we play, but see, there's a necessary part on the divine side. And all three are challenged in the work of salvation. Amen. That itself tells you how great it's going to be in its culmination. Our ability... To try and grasp it, and yet be in some measure unable. See, we look through a glass darkly, but that doesn't have so much to do with our environment as it has to do with the exceeding greatness of his purpose. You see, the salvation is so great, we're still dipping back to the beginning and finding things out that we haven't seen. Have you discovered the fullness of what happened when you came in? Well, how much greater is the fullness of what's going to happen when we go in? Amen. You see, it's, it's, I mean, you think about it. Have you, have you? exhausted the idea of obtaining the glory of Christ? I'm not going to tonight. I can tell you that for sure. You see, we're just going to kind of touch on the hem of the garment tonight. We're going to begin to see a little bit about what's in here, but it is a great salvation. That's what I'm telling you. It's a great salvation. Are you with me tonight? The greatness of salvation more closely to our text can be seen by the dramatic change in those that are participating in it and are being saved. Amen. This is the great thing about this work. You see what he's doing? He's taking beggars, as Brother Tim said. That's what he's doing. And he's taking us from the dung hill. He didn't find us in a very pretty place, but after it's all said and done, it's going to be a pretty place and we're going to be a pretty sight. Amen. See, he's taking paupers and he's making them sons. That's what he's doing. He's taken people that used to be idolaters and he's going to set them in the throne room. 
You see, the Thessalonians, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. They were idolaters when God found them, but they will be sons of the Most High God when He has done with them. Amen. And that's one way of measuring the greatness of this salvation. Amen. That's why we're in it, isn't it? That's why you're here tonight, isn't it? Amen. Because it's worth it. Amen. See, we don't, have to, we don't have to play this up on our own. God's already put forth a great salvation that causes rejoicing. The salvation of God is a great salvation. Now, I just want to give a tribute to the gospel before we get into this. The gospel has fallen on hard times. Not so much tonight, but in other churches, maybe some places where you meet. Where the gospel is so rarely heard. But the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation, and I'm not ashamed of it, are you? Amen. I know you're not. It's just rhetorical. See, it is the power. If men shut their mouths to the gospel... God will quit empowering people to come into the kingdom of Christ. I think, that's, I think that's really how we can relegate all this show stuff that seems to be happening in the churches. Believe me, if men aren't preaching the gospel, God's not saving them. It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ from which God funnels power to deliver men from the power of darkness and to translate them into the kingdom of His dear Son. It must be proclaimed, and it is the reason why you are who you are today. The grace of God that came to you came when you believed the truth and He gave you His Spirit, sanctified you, and set you apart for glory. And in fact, when this thing is culminated, you know what we're going to sing? Salvation to our God and unto the Lamb who died. By His own, own blood, He has made us kings and priests. And once again, we will rehearse the great gospel of the blessed God. Now look at the different ways in which the gospel is presented. I think this is marvelous. For example, there's the Word. The word of the gospel. God has done something. There's a message in the gospel because God has done something marvelous. You know, the gospel is good news. If you're preaching bad news, you're not preaching the gospel. The gospel is 100% good news. It doesn't mean there are none of the things that surround it. But that's what the gospel is. It's good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, for he is the great foundation of this salvation. See, the salvation is, is just as sure as the work of Christ. Amen. It's good news that he came, and it's good news that right now he's at the right hand of the Father administrating salvation. It's good news. It's good news. It's called the gospel of God because it hadn't, had it not originated itself in the heart of God, there wouldn't be a salvation. He is the author of it, for from him, through him, and to him are all things. Blessed be God. Amen. It is the gospel of the grace of God. That's what it is. He has equipped us. See, this is the day of his great favor. This is the day of salvation. That's what grace is. It's God's favor being poured out. And we're living in that time. You know of his favor. It's the gospel of his son, how precious it is. See, Jesus is the one whose suffering has brought about good news. And this is a precious thing to God. Father. See, his son rented his soul an offering, and that's why we have good news to tell today. It's the gospel of peace. God is making peace between men and God and men and men, and when it's all done, he's going to gather all things together in one, even in Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. In Christ Jesus. That's how it's going to end up. Amen. It's the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of your salvation, because I say if gospel cannot be experienced, boy, it's not... It's, it's not much of a salvation if it can't be experienced. I hope you don't mind the term experience, but that's what, that's what it is. It's an experience. We're the ones being saved. We're the ones that were washed. We're the ones that were justified. We're the ones that have been set apart through the Holy Spirit. And we're the ones that are going to obtain the glory of Christ. It's the gospel of your salvation. And the everlasting gospel. How good news this is. You see, the gospel is giving us things that we can keep, and it speaks of a future that will never end. It's good to know that we have things that we hope in that won't come to an end, because this life is full of things that come to an end. Yeah. It is. But the gospel says, I'm going to give you something that won't end. Amen. And I'm going to put you in a kingdom that doesn't end. Amen. <laughs> and you're going to be married to someone who doesn't end. Amen. See, he's been made the high priest because of an everlasting life. Boy, it's good news, the everlasting gospel. And one last thing, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Yes. Amen. You see, God has been satisfied through the offering of Christ Jesus. Amen. 
And now he is dispensing forth the blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. See, he's been blessed, and now he's, he's dispensing the blessing to those who believe on his Son. It's a marvelous truth to see. So I thank God for the gospel, and I'll continue to preach it, whether it's popular or not. It really doesn't matter to me. I'm really not asking people what they want to hear. Unless you're telling me you want to hear the gospel, it really doesn't matter to me. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's made us who we are, and it'll make us who we will be. Now, the Thessalonians, if you look into Acts chapter 17 and verse 1 and following, you'll find what happened there at Thessalonica. Paul came through that region, preached the gospel, and the Thessalonians believed the truth, but it, it was in a pretty bad situation. You may recall there were some Jews that were envious, and they stirred up men of, men of a baser sort. Men that weren't real thinking men. <laughs> they didn't know why they were there. And yet they stirred up trouble for the Thessalonians. It was a hard thing. Paul had to leave prematurely, get out of town, and move down the road to Berea. And uh, Paul writes back to them and rehearses their salvation. He says, you turn to God from idols and serve the living and true God and wait for his son from heaven. And he said, we're the ones finding that out on the road. All through Macedonia and Achaia, people are telling us of your reception. They saw the change. Yeah. Amen. He rehearsed to them certain things that were at work in them. He says, the work of your faith. You guys are extending yourself for things you can't see. Amen. Isn't that a blessing when you can find someone that's doing that? <laughs> that life's not be directed by the things of which they can see and the things that they can feel and touch. They're directed by things that they can't feel and touch. They're directed by the unseen, the work of your faith, and the labor of love. You're extending, your, you're extending yourself because of your love toward Christ and toward God and your love toward the brother. And this is, this is being sounded abroad. Isn't that something? Amen. And your patience of hope, you've not given up, even though it's cost you something to receive Christ. You've not given up. There's something that you're seeing beyond that cross that you're bearing. That seems to you to be worth the effort. And you're going right through the cross to the glory. Isn't that the way Jesus went? Us too. The Thessalonians knew this. And they were persevering. Isn't that something? Amen. It's marvelous. He wrote back finding out that they were still walking by faith, not by sight. And he writes them a second letter. And he tells them the reason why these things are happening to you. These things are confirming something. And that's where we come to our text. Amen. These are confirming that God has chosen you. When you see faith at work in yourself, you see a love toward the brethren, you see yourself laboring because of things you can't see, and you're sticking to it even when it's hard, it's a confirmation that God has chosen you. You see more happen when you were saved than you realize, and one thing that happened is He's the one who chose you. From your perspective, it looked like you chose Him. If someone said the message, your heart was moved, and you received out and grabbed hold of Jesus. But it was, it was Him who chose you. Remember Jesus said that to his disciples, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. You don't think those were the only ones. See, in salvation, God's the one doing the choosing. He's choosing. And he chose you. <laughs> Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, someone preached the gospel to you, you received it, and it confirmed God's choice. The changes confirmed God's choice of you. It's a marvelous truth. But he's telling us in the midst of all this wonderful activity that is happening now, it's just the beginning. It's what he's chosen you to that is the great thing. Amen. Hmm? That's the great thing. You see, now is not the great thing. Then is the great thing. He's chosen you. He has slated you to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a marvelous, marvelous truth. Now, I want to deal with this first thing, and then we'll get to the glory of Christ and some of the things that that might entail. One thing we see here that is so edifying is we have, in fact, been called according to an eternal purpose. The Bible calls it the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. If we were to step up into the heavenly places, we would see the purpose like a divine line. If you look back into the past, there's no beginning. You can't see it. It's hazy to us. In fact, in fact, through the Spirit, the Apostle has to give us the beginning because that's about as far back as we can have some clarity <laughs> at the beginning of creation, but it goes, extends back further than that. Yeah. Further than that, and if you were looking to time eternity, the purpose extends on, but in the middle of that, God drops down through His Son into the world and into time, and His Son dies on the cross. 
And in the midst of this space that we call time, he's saving men. That's what he's doing. It's a marvelous thing. The things of which he is doing right now, sanctifying you through the Spirit, saving you, delivering you, strengthening you, are all things that are moved and directed by an eternal purpose that has no beginning or end. Amen. It's the eternal purpose which he purposed through Christ. Boy, when you see that, it, 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 at just the general impression, it leaves you thinking salvation is pretty big. Salvation's pretty big. And it is. It's very big. One of the things the Spirit sought to do throughout the church is to make sure that men saw this truth. That God was not operating, he was not operating arbitrarily or reacting to, to men's needs or sin, but he was responding according to a purpose. Paul wrote to the Romans, and he said, All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. It's good to know that when things are out of control, huh? Well, things aren't really out of control. But that's how it appears. Paul had to write to tell the Thessalonians that the great apostasy was coming one day. Man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. He is, through the, through the devil, going to spew out all manner of false doctrines and lead away those that don't receive a love of the truth. It's a tragic circumstance, and it's going to look like everything's out of control. But he's telling us, no, it's not. It's in control. He's chosen you. He's sanctified you. He knows exactly what he's doing. And in the end, you're going to obtain the glory of Christ. That's, that's, that's the truth. Yeah, this, well, I hope I'm conveying this. I really need grace. Someone pray now. I need grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul introduces this letter. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. We all have ministers by whom we believe. This is by divine design. Amen. You didn't just happen to bump into that person who led you to Christ. God raised this person up. Just like he raised up the apostle Paul to give this message to Thessalonica. He intersected our path with a godly person. See, it's all according to purpose. It looks arbitrary from the world's viewpoint, but it's, it's not. It's according to purpose. And another text of scripture that we find <coughs> in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. says that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present world according to the will of God. God wants the world out of the church. Amen. He doesn't want it in the church. Amen. When we're saved, he kicked it out of our hearts. Now he doesn't want to use it as a bait to bring people in. I'm sorry. God doesn't want your worldly pomp. He doesn't want that because his will is for us to be delivered from it. Amen. And everything about salvation is calculated to do just that very thing. Amen. In fact, when his son comes and we in that moment of time see the world's fleeing away, we'll say, farewell. Amen. Farewell, poor world. See ya. See, the world's crucified to us and us to the world because that's his will that that happened. You see what I'm saying? It's God's purpose. And when Paul told the Philippians to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, he gave them the right incentive. He didn't leave them looking at them, and don't you either. Don't you leave people looking at themselves when you exhort them. You send them out in the power of God, for it is God that works in you both to will and do of his own good pleasure. God's got a design and purpose in salvation. And over and over you can find this. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That tells you it's an extensive purpose. You see, salvation isn't simple. It really isn't. I don't know who started saying that, but I don't know how you can read the scriptures and labor in the doctrine and come up with this idea that salvation is simple. It's not simple. It's very extensive. God is working according to a purpose. Now, some things that this confirms to us, when you see this truth that God is working according to purpose, there, there are some things that are confirmed to us in this. One is, God is really not reacting to the deeds of men. He, he really didn't pity us. That, that really isn't the highest view. I, understand, I guess from one point, okay, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I, I don't mean to say that God is some robot up there just checking off a list and his concern isn't really for you. Don't get me wrong there, but there was a higher motive than what you were doing. There was a higher motive. Amen. You see, God's purpose he made in himself, and he is responding to us upon the basis of that. It's a great thing when you see this. His purpose is driven by the inner working of his own person. 
to let that sink in because that's a marvelous truth when you see that. I like this in Romans 9, 15 to 16. Romans chapter 9 and verse 15 to 16. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Amen. See, he wasn't looking to the runners or to the willers. <laughs> he found the motive in himself. You know what I'm saying here? Amen. It was within himself. I will, I will. You see, that's what salvation is. Salvation is God doing what he wants to do. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, this is a wonderful thing when you see that. Did you know that salvation in all of its inner workings, God has designed it in such a way that the working of it brings satisfaction to him? I'll tell you, this is a great truth when you can see this because this seemed to slip me. I'm not saying a preacher said this, but I got the idea that when I came to God for mercy, for sins, that God was somehow just kind of, okay, I, here's a little bit, but just, okay, just try not to do that. Don't come anymore for mercy. I'm getting tired of dispensing this mercy to you. And those of you who are weak, I'm certainly getting tired of dispensing strength to you. Why can't you just stand up and be strong? I don't get tired. Why do you? See, I had that kind of idea about God, but I was wrong. You see, salvation is called the good pleasure of His will. It is. He was pleased to bring you out of darkness and put you into His light. He was pleased to deliver you from the power of darkness and translate you into the kingdom of His dear Son. He was pleased to renew you. He was pleased to give you mercy. He was pleased to justify you and wash you. Amen. He was pleased to do this. This gives him pleasure. And to this present day, present day when you come to the, great, to the throne of grace in order to find help in the time of need, he's pleased to dispense it and come again and he'll be more pleased to give you more mercy and give you more grace. Amen. All of salvation brings pleasure to the living God. Amen. Boy, it's good when you can see that. Amen. You see, I'm showing you uh, salvation is designed. God was looking to himself. That's when he designed salvation. So it's actually an expression of his own person is what it really is. You know, God's purpose is just as sure as his person. If he's designed it according to his own person and nature, then that makes salvation just as credible as the person of God. I am God. I change not. And he's been doing the same purpose from the beginning. God hasn't changed his purpose. He couldn't change his purpose any more than he changed his person. He'd have to deny, deny himself than to save us. See? See, he's faithful when he deals with us and righteous because salvation is an expression of God's person. We have an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters within the veil Amen. where Christ, who is the forerunner, has for us entered in. Aren't you glad he didn't anchor your hope and your faith in your own works? Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand where... You're justified by faith. You're telling me you're not working. I, I got a question about your faith. There's something wrong with that. So don't get me wrong there. I'm not saying works are involved. So don't get me wrong. But nonetheless, that's not where he's anchored your hope. That's not where he's anchored your confidence. Amen. He's anchored it in someone who doesn't shift or vary. Amen. Even to this day, I can tell you right now, before noon hits, you're already upset in your works. Amen. You've got higher ambitions than you can actually fulfill in this body. He's anchored your hope in a sure foundation. He's not anchored it downward. He's anchored it upward into his own person. Amen. It's a good thing when you can see that. Well, one last thing. Salvation is designed according to God's capability, not yours. I'll tell you, if he designed salvation according to my capability, the Bible would be a very small book. We wouldn't be getting off page one, I can tell you right now. But why is it so full? Because when God, so to speak, designed the borders of the greatness of salvation, he looked into the reservoir of his infinite mercy and of his infinite love and his infinite wisdom and his infinite ability and his power. And that's where we get the greatness of salvation. Amen. Boy, it's a wonderful, wonderful truth to see. I'm showing you that salvation is great and it's according to design. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we were able to ask. <laughs> That's what salvation is. Hmm? Eye has not seen, ear hath not heard, neither entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. 
I understand that he's given us his spirit, but from one degree, that verse stands alone. Have you perceived the whole? Has I seen the whole? Hmm? Have you seen someone glorified with the glory of Christ? That's not quite yet happened. See, there's aspects of salvation that we still, we're grasping hold of, and we can see some of it, but the greatness of it we have not yet grasped. <laughs> you see, we see in part. But before it's over, you're going to see, whoa, there's nobody on earth that could have come up with something like this. That's what he's saying. This is a great salvation. A great salvation. Another thing we see there, God does not work aimlessly or unintentionally. God does have an intention in everything he does. There's not a thing God does without a cause. He doesn't accidentally do anything. He doesn't unintentionally do anything, and salvation is full of intention. You say, well, what is that intention? I know the thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What did he say in our text? I've chosen you to salvation. See, there are some, when the divine intent and the gavel falls, they're going to fall right down the side of the pit. But that's not the ones who have believed on Christ. He's got a good intention for you, and he's got a future that spans out into time eternity. I don't care how far you go into the future of the believer. It's a bright, bright, bright day. Amen. You see, for the one who is not saved, uh, the divine timeline one day is going to drop you right into hell. But not those that are believers in Christ Jesus. The Spirit is sanctified, set you apart, put a seal on you. And the day of Christ, God is going to say, this foundation is sure. I know them that are mine. You're one of mine. Enter into the good pleasure of your master. Boy, this is good news. Hope you don't mind me rejoicing this some. Are you rejoicing in this truth? You see these things? These are good, good things to see. God's purpose, I want you to see this. From one degree, it cannot be hindered. Does that mean it's not possible to lose your salvation? No, that's not what I'm saying. Of course, that's kind of a weird kind of terminology, as if somehow accidentally I lost it. Like, I like Brother Jay said that one year. Oh, where is that set of keys I lost? It, that, it can't happen quite that way. But he is, brethren. He is going to choose a people. He is going to sanctify a people. He is going to justify a people. And, brethren, he is going to glorify a people. The issue isn't whether God's going to do this. The issue is whether it's going to be to you. Amen. That is the issue of contention. That's the issue of contention. I like this. I, I, I quote this quite often. Isaiah 46, 9-11, because it is so powerful and full of confidence. But God has good reasons for confidence. Remember the former things of old. You remember the times when my purpose intersected with conflict with men. and you, What happened to men? You remember Egypt when I delivered you. That was my purpose. Remember what happened to Pharaoh and his army. Don't forget that. You remember times of old. Was I able to do what I was intending to do? For I am God and there is none else. That was my little parenthetical thought, just in case you were wondering. I am God. There's none else. None like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. What's he done in our text? He's from the beginning chosen you. He's planning. And he is purposing and he is executing. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I will. Amen. Calling the ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will also do it. Amen. That's not the issue of question. Is he going to do it? How do we know that he's going to do it to us? This purpose is being worked out in his son. That's where it's being worked out. See, when he chose you, he puts you in the place where he's working this purpose unhindered. It's being worked out in Christ, unhindered in Christ. That's the truth. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to accomplish this. He is. It's going to happen through Jesus. Boy, he really favored you when he put you in his son. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son. And look what he's made unto us already. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Do you think the devil could hinder that? Do you think he wouldn't have hindered that? And yet you stand clean right here. You're justified. You've been given an understanding. You're seeing the truth. You're relishing in it. <laughs> can he finish it? Oh, yes, he can finish it. He can. See, Christ is the place 
so to speak, where eternal security has truth. And you're in Christ by the faith of him. From one degree, it's true. From one degree, eternal security has truth. I think some of these people that were pioneering Calvinism and some of these things were kind of on a high plane. They might have been misunderstood. I don't know. What do you think? There is a place where his purpose is unhindered. It's in Christ. Can you be in Christ? Can you, be, can you abide in Christ and not produce much fruit? Is that even possible? Can that happen? Can you walk by the faith of Christ Jesus, keeping the faith and somehow end up in hell? We might as well all go home if it's that way. It's not that way. This purpose is being worked unhindered, and that's why we have the rejoicing of the hope. That's why. What a truth to see. God's purpose cannot be hindered. Now, I want you to see why these things are so critical, and then we'll move right into this glory. One thing is because God has asked you to hope against hope. Have you seen anybody glorified yet? Hasn't even happened, and yet you trust in it? You remember God asked Abraham to trust and hope in something that had not happened. I mean, had we ever heard of before Abraham, of someone in their old age bearing a child like that? I mean, you've got to think. <laughs> Was that a common experience? It wasn't, but it did happen. He hoped in it. Faith got a hold of something that hadn't even happened yet. Your faith done the same thing. He's asked us to hope against hope. We've got to have a God who can fulfill this. Another thing, he's asked you to live in expectation of a work that is utterly impossible to you. I mean, we can't change one iota of our character alone, <laughs> let alone obtaining the glory of Christ. We've got to have a God that's faithful that can do this because the work depends on him, not on you. Amen. See what I'm saying here? Amen. He has asked you to sacrifice your earthly ambitions and the pleasures of life in this world. Jesus says, take up your cross daily, and one day you'll lay it down, and I'll give you a crown. Hmm? Right. That's what he said. He said, if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. Right. We've got to know that we've got a God that's faithful, that is purposeful, that is not working arbitrarily, that has a purpose that cannot be hindered, and doesn't change in his purpose. We have that. God has, from the beginning, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth to the obtaining of the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I hope you can see some of that. That was very edifying to me, and I hope it was to you too. I think what I'm really saying is what he says in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. He's going to do it. Now, he is. He is. Just like the psalmist said, he will perfect that which concerns you. He will. And that's why men daily are offering up their life for the sake of that glory. Now, defining the glory. We have had this in all the messages, an attempt to define the glory. And you can see that the preachers that did so had a little bit of struggle trying to define glory. And there is a reason for that. Because glory is so great that one sweeping statement will cut off part of what that glory really is. You'll either speak so generally that people won't see some of the specific implications or you'll speak too specifically and you're gonna lop off some aspect of his glory that's spoken about in scripture. I'll just tell you one aspect. From the viewpoint of our text, look at what we're looking at. We're looking at a people that are in the process of being transformed. They believe the gospel, and now they're going through some change. The Spirit has sanctified them, setting them apart, changing their affections, giving them new direction. All these things are in the work. But the work's not over because he tells us the glory of Christ is yet to come. So we're kind of in the middle of that mix. Now, how do we define the glory of Christ when you think about things like that? Well, I think what we've generally said about glory is true. It is a manifestation. The glory of God is the manifestation of God. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it is. But it's more than that. So what is glory as it relates to us and being transformed? Well, here's what it is. <coughs> glory means entering into the full measure of our maker's design and making and remaking us on at least two levels as I see it. One is from within and one is from without. You might look at that this way. From the viewpoint of capacity, the glory of Christ will mean that we will have the capacity of Christ. I'm not saying we're going to become gods like he is. He will always be the son of capital M, but he does intend on us sharing the capacity. And I'm going to, I'm going to affirm that. That's true. 
But with capacity comes a reason. Why is he giving us this capacity? Because there is a work to do. Amen. And that work happens to be in association with the Savior in the world to come. Yeah. It's a marvelous thing. When you talk about attaining the glory of Christ, we are in a very large field. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That when God remolded and recreated us, he had a divine purpose in doing so. It's not yet been realized. We've not fully attained it. We have it in part. We see some of the life of Christ at work in us, and we're, we're involved ourselves in the work, but it's not to its fullness yet. But God has a clear idea of what that fullness is. And I'm just going to say a few things about it tonight. Paul would say it this way. In Philippians chapter 3, he said, Not that I've already attained, either we're already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Amen. Isn't that a marvelous truth? Amen. I like how Brother Gibbons said it one year. He said, God laid hold on you so you could lay hold on something he has for you. That's, that's a marvelous truth. So we're in the training ground. He's training us and shaping us and getting us ready to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me tonight? Amen. Now, what is meant... The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very interesting phraseology. Well, we, we obviously, and I've been making this point, this is the perspective of like the ultimate end, the culmination of salvation. It's that last day that the young brother spoke about this morning. It's the day in which all things that offend are gathered out and the sun shall shine. And the, the righteous shall shine in the kingdom of their Father. That's the day I'm talking about. It's the day in which we'll admire Christ is coming when he is glorified to the glory of the Father and of the angels and in his own glory. That's the day I'm talking about. That's the day of apprehension. That's the day in which we will obtain. And it means entering in. I hope I can bring this home to you. Entering into the glory of Christ as a glorified man. Okay, now give me, give me a chance to, to open this up to you. The Bible says that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. That means there are others that are yet to come to follow in his glory. Now Hebrews kind of opens this up to us in the second chapter, but just deal with that first chapter. The whole chapter is dedicated to an argument that tells us that Jesus is greater than the angels. I mean, to which of the angels said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. <laughs> Why is that an argument? Don't we know that the word is above the angels? Wasn't he in the beginning with God and was God? Why is there a contention? Why is the whole first chapter given to talk about that? Because men have been made a little lower than the angels. And because when Jesus entered back into glory, he didn't do it divinely, so to speak. He did it as a man. Who is this king of glory? You might say it this way. Where is his position? Where does he rank? And the Father spends the first chapter telling you he ranks above the angels. You might say it this way. Who is this new race of man that is coming in? Who, who are these? Who are these glorified ones? You see, Jesus entered into his glory, and when he did, the first chapter of Hebrews came about. He's greater than the angels. Who is it? A man? A man's greater than the angels? Yes, a man. And then he gets to the second chapter, and we enter in. Huh? I mean, brethren, he is not given the world to come into the hands of angelic halls. But he says in, in, a, in another place, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I mean, what is the son of man that you regard him? I want to read that text to you because I don't want to butcher it. Hebrews chapter 2. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But we see not yet all things put under him. It's not all in our hands. It's not evident yet. We've not obtained the glory of Christ. And then he says this, but we see Jesus. It's all in his hands. Whose hands? The man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, it's a marvelous truth to see. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering death, but that's not where he's at now. He is crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Why is he doing that? 
because he's bringing many sons to glory. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Amen. He has forged the trail to glory for a new race of man and we are going to follow in his steps. Amen. That's what obtaining the glory of Christ is all about. It's a marvelous, marvelous truth to see. I like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. As we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. That's what obtaining the glory of Christ is talking about. Now, I listed these two things as I can see it that are kind of categories for the obtaining of the glory of Christ. And I'm just going to say these things and we'll be done. We have been called to obtain a glorious capacity. Ability, you might think of it that way. And we've been called to obtain a glorious stewardship of work in the world to come. Now just give me a moment just to, again, we're just going to touch on a few things here. Obviously, I couldn't lay out everything that was there. It would take way too long, and I don't know it all. <laughs> so I'm just giving you a few things that I do know. What about capacity or ability? When we see him, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be transformed in a moment. You know, on the day that Christ appears and we are transformed, never again will, will there be a question as to who you're associated with. Amen. See, right now it doesn't appear what we shall be. But when God finishes the project and you obtain the glory of Christ, nobody's going to wonder what kind of workmanship you are. Amen. You see, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness. They'll see it. You will be an admirable thing. You will. You, are royal, you will be a royal diadem in the hand of our God. When people look at you, they won't have to be told, this is the work of God, just in case you didn't know. I mean, when angelic hosts came down to earth, men didn't confuse and wonder. So I wonder, I wonder what town you're from. They knew, didn't they? When you're glorified, they're not going to wonder what town you're from. And they're not going to be saying you're from Joplin. And they're not going to be saying you're from Indiana. That's not what they're going to be saying. These are obviously citizens of heaven. They've got the mark of their father on them. His seed is in them, and it has culminated in this great work. We can see that glory in you. We don't have to be told. I mean, that's how he's going to make those who are the synagogue of Satan come and bow at your feet. That's how that's going to happen. They're going to see the glory, and their knees are going to hit the earth. It's going to happen. Amen. Because we're going to obtain the glory of Christ. What does that mean? Let's break that down for just a moment. It means that there's not going to be any shadow of turning in you. I mean, you can turn me from one degree, you can see some shadow. We've all got some shadow. Paul even said, we wait for the hope of righteousness. We've not yet attained yet. We've got some shadow. But I'll tell you, in the day of Christ, you shall search wide and long, and you'll not find a shadow. You'll not. Amen. You see, God is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You know why when men confronted God, it was such a hard thing? Because they had fault. That's why. Flesh is faulty. But when we discard flesh and we take upon ourselves that spiritual body, there shall not be a flinch of shame of any sort in the presence of the glory of God because we shall in that day be found faultless before the presence of His glory. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful thing. You see, Jesus is harmless. He's set apart from sinners. He's holy. There's not a bit of shadow in Jesus. You know it and I know it. It doesn't matter where you look in the Gospel of Mark. If you look in John, if you look in the book of Revelation, there's not a thing that Jesus has done. There's not a thing that Jesus has said that is not holy, beautiful, and glorious. And that'll be true of you in the day that he comes. Oh, I can't wait for that. I can't wait. I can say like David, Lord, forget the sins of my youth. Those are the things that we're ashamed of. But they're going to be gone when he comes again. That's part of obtaining that glory. You will never, ever again face an inward conflict. Right now, we do have to confess that when I will to do good, evil is present with me. I mean, in, my, in, in the new man, I delight in the law of God. But I see another law in my members waging war. And it continually hinders consistent thinking toward God. And it disrupts consistent desires. Uh -huh. And you have to stop and wrestle with it. Do you realize how much we could get done if we didn't have to wrestle with competing yeah. thoughts? Yeah. 
These things, we don't even want it. The fact that we groan means it's not really us. That's the secret to winning the battle. Amen. That's not you. Why are you groaning? Because that's not you. But Jesus doesn't face any competition within. Huh? Can God be tempted? Can Jesus be tempted now that he's been glorified? And when you're glorified, that's the end of temptation. Amen. We can say in that day that he returns and we, so to speak, discard flesh. The devil has nothing in me. <laughs> Farewell, temptation. Bye-bye. Farewell, competing interests. Farewell. Never again will a law compete with my desire toward God. That's a wonderful truth. I hope you don't... I uh, hope I'm not tedious in saying that. I'll, it's true. You will in that day have limitless understanding. I don't think that I should cut off and say that we won't be growing in some degree. I, I, in fact, I'm kind of... Now I'm stumbling as a man here. Speaking to talk about these things. Let me just say it the way the scripture says it. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. What doesn't God know about you? In that day, there's not anything that you won't know about that. <laughs> You'll never again stumble over some section of truth. Never again. You will have absolute freedom in the truth. In fact, the things that you have already seen in the truth that have kind of slipped away... You put that up in heaven, but when you get there, it's waiting for you. It's true. It's waiting for you. And it'll all come together. I mean, you know how glorious it is just to have a little truth come together right here. I mean, if it wasn't for the new body, we'd explode of joy if when all of it came together. It would just kill us. I mean, doesn't it kill you now? You see some great truth in Scripture, and joy erupts. And you want to sing a song? Put on the homecoming video and start singing to the glory of God. But that's what I do anyway. What does it mean to obtain joy and gladness? If it wasn't for understanding, you couldn't rejoice in the thing that you're going to see when he comes. But when he comes, you're going to have full understanding. The import of it will be so marvelous that it will require a new body for you to admire it and look upon it. It's a great thing, but in that day, you'll not scratch again for understanding. You're going to have it in its full measure. We'll know even as we are known. And we will enrobe a body that is designed for its work. Even in the world, God makes bodies that are designed for its work. The body that we shall have, look how it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. It is sown in dishonor. It is. Death is dishonorable. It's not a pretty sight. Because sin is not a pretty sight. But that's not how it's raised, is it? It's raised in glory, and it's sown in weakness. But that's not how God's leaving it. It's raised in power. I mean, think about that. He tells us in another section to the Philippians, remember what he told the Philippians? That we're going to receive a body like unto his glorious body. Why? Because he has a work for us. Let's get to that. Before I do that, I did want to say this. I wanted to say something about our heavenly status, and we'll, and we'll get through this, and we'll, we'll be done. This is so marvelous. Status. Who you are. Where you fit. I like this. This was read this morning, but I'd like to read it again. I'm going to read it out of Psalms. Open the, it was recorded from 1 Samuel, but I'm going to read it out of Psalms here. It says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. That's what salvation is all about. I'll tell you, before this thing is over, you're going, to re you're going to be rubbing shoulders with Michael and Gabriel. I mean, this isn't wishy stuff. This isn't kid stuff. This is real. Amen. And this is really going to happen. Amen. We're going to be laborers together. I mean, the angel already did reveal that to John. I mean, quit bowing down to me. This isn't appropriate. We're companions together in this labor. How more so when we obtain the glory of Christ. Amen. In fact, we'll kind of be calling the shots then over the angels. Because they're going to be made a little lower than us at that point. You, I mean, you see what I'm saying here? This is, this is Bible. This is what it says in the scriptures. This is a marvelous truth. You're going to be laboring together with people like John the Baptist and people like Paul the Apostle and men like Peter who didn't put his foot in his mouth. How many times do you know he put his foot in his mouth? Don't say that around me. I am tempted to punch people like that. Or at least tell them, please be quiet. How many times have you said things that you ought not to have? Peter the Rock. 
That's who he is. You see, we're going to be laboring together with these kind of people. Marvelous. That will be our status. We will be partakers with the, of the inheritance with the saints. Those are holy people. We're going to be amongst that multitude singing in the day that Christ returns. Salvation to our God and unto the Lamb. And we ourselves will have crowns that we will cast at the feet of the Savior. We will also be sons of the Most High God. To me, this is the greatest and most precious thing about our status in heaven. That's how you're going to be known. He's a child of the King. He's a son of the Most High. I like this uh, exhortation. It's a good one. Come out from amongst them and be separate. Huh? Be separate. Does being separate pay off? Well, it doesn't pay off in the world, but it sure does pay off in glory. I mean, you've got to be a stranger somewhere. You might want to make it here. Amen. You see, when God comes in his great glory, stranger status is going away. Everybody's going to know who you are. You're a son of the Most High God. And I shall receive you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters. It's a marvelous thing. You know, when Jesus, after he was raised, before he went back, he had a, he had a talk with Mary there. He said, don't touch me, Mary. I've not yet ascended to my father. And then he told, told her one of the most precious things that could be said to a group of people that had just forsaken and left Christ. Remember, the shepherd will be smitten and the flock shall scatter. And that's what they did. Peter had to recover from a denial. How sweet do you suppose the words would have come from the mouth of Mary to say, I go to my father and your father. To my God and your God. Methinks he had a vision of glory. Amen. When we shall be there in the kingdom of our Father. Amen. I'll tell you, this is a good thing to see. What about the work? What about that work? Well, I, I can't get into all this. We've really got to shut down. But a few things that I can say about it. Generally speaking, in that day you'll be noted for competence and consistency. Even here, all of us, even the most faithful amongst us, if we could say something like that, feel as if they could be more consistent, more dependable. I mean, I've made a little bit of progress. I've not made, made near as much as some of you, and probably many of you. I mean, that, that's for sure. And, uh, but yet, there's more that can be made. <laughs> In that day, the Bible says that you shall be a pillar in the temple of our God Amen. and go out no more. But there's more to it than not going out. I mean, he left, can you see that he left that open for a lot of import? There's a lot of truth in there. Anytime Jesus speaks very generally, that means there's a lot of import. You can see a lot of scriptures connecting with something like that. A pillar. So what is a pillar? Well, it's a, it's a central part of the work, I can tell you that. <laughs> take the pillar away and the building falls. How important of a role do you suppose you'll take in the world to come? Remove you and it falls. I mean, that's kind of the idea. You see what I'm saying? I mean, that won't happen theoretically, but you will be in the heart of the work. Amen. Yes. And God will, without any inhibition, be able to give you an important thing. That's, that's part of being a pillar. You'll be noted for consistency. Everything you do will be perfect. You will be able to do it exactly as you want. Would to God we could do it exactly as I want. If I could preach exactly as I want. You know how often I feel I betray the saints of God? Because... When I preach, it seems as if what I have seen is greater than what I said. That's one of my greatest nightmares, is to somehow present salvation smaller than what it is. But every time, it seems like I'm not able to get it as great as what I've seen. That will not happen in the day of Christ's return. I'll be able to do it just as I want to do it. And it will be complete, I'll tell you. This is the way Jesus is. Jesus doesn't struggle to do what he wants to do. He can get it done exactly as he wants to. You will too. You will too. And I've already said this, but you will be associates with Christ. You will be. I'm sorry. You're not going to be laboring somewhere in the, glory, in the corner of glory land while Jesus is at the heart of things. It's not like that. Jesus did not die to make you a janitor in the world to come. I'm sorry. That's, he didn't die to do that. In fact, by his own blood, he's made us kings and priests. We're going to more fully enter into that status when we enter there. I like this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 and 17. He talks about our sonship. 
And he says, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And Paul later says, who went through a lot of conflict, I reckon, I reckon that the present sufferings aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Amen. He saw this about obtaining the glory of Christ. He saw it. Are you seeing this tonight? I hope you are. If you have, I know your heartstrings are being pulled toward glory. We might say, like you said, Brother Gordon, <laughs> just take us home now. I can't tell you how often I've thought about that. Here, amidst a study, you see some great thing and say, Lord, please don't make me come down from the mountain to those grumbling Israelites. Just take me now. Huh? Right, you've had the same experience. You know what I'm talking about. We shall be joint heirs. If we die with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer or endure, we will reign with him. And brethren, that is a faithful saying. You can stake your life on it. Revelation 3, 21, Jesus calls out to his church that has gone astray. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with, his, with my father in his throne. Jesus is laboring together with God. You will be laboring together with Christ. It's begun here in a small measure, but it will certainly be promoted to a greater measure when we obtain the glory of Christ Jesus. And by some token, I know this has caused some great controversy, but it need not. The very fact that there's controversy over it tells me that there's something great to be seen in it. By some degree, we are going to have a ruling capacity in the world to come. I don't claim to know all the ins and outs, but I can tell you I want it. And I know it's clearly taught in Scripture. Amen. It's there. In Revelation chapter 2, again, the promise goes out. He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. That's something. There's a truth in that. Amen. He, did, he did say to the faithful man that kept that good talent and increased it, be thou over ten cities. You may say, well, that wasn't, you know, that was, that was like an analogy. He didn't really mean you'd be over ten cities. It doesn't matter to me whether it's an analogy or not. If it's an analogy, it's given the general's truth. You're going to be ruling in some way, <laughs> in some capacity. You're going to have some charge. It's a marvelous thing. Ruling capacity. I like this in Luke 19. Again, that same section. It came to pass that when he returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he gave, who had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. I'm telling you, this is a good place to talk about stewardship. Why should we give? Because it's the right thing to do. Well, why don't you tell them this, and pretty soon their hands are going to open up. I mean, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. Now, what I'm telling you is that when Jesus comes, that's when you enter abundantly into this richness. That's when the fullness of it begins to flower out. Amen. And in that day, I'm here to tell you, we're going to be like him, and we're going to enter in to Christ's work. Amen. Jesus himself said in that great prayer in John 17, I will that they be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, because thou lovest me from the foundation of the world. Where did he save us? From the foundation of the world. And in his great love toward Christ, when we obtain that glory, we're going to be with him where he is.